Hi everyone, um, I'm uh, Chris Beer, I'm from Department of Regional Australia, Local Government, Arts and Sport. Um, and due to good um, business alignments and MOUs, I also moonlight as IT for Office Spatial Policy. Um, just getting an idea, quick show of hands. Um, Commonwealth, state, local, no. Um, uh, Non-EL uh, non or SES, one person, ELs, uh, SES, couple, cool. This originally, this idea originally was um, just collaborative IT development and then I realised that it's the same for everything. Development is development. We do policy development, we do standards development, we do IT development, we do everything is developing. If you build something and it doesn't change then it's not good public service. Um, what we're doing, and it's a, a nice segue from the last one, is a proof of concept with a GMO on GovForge. So who here is in IT? and knows what SourceForge is. SourceForge is how open source software gets written. Basically, developers from all over the world come into a system, they can download the code or a copy of the code, they can work on it, they can commit it back to the master, it then gets integrated into the whole shebang and then you get stable releases. Um, so we're doing this proof of concept of, of GovForge, but it could equally apply to policy, to standards, to anything, um, where we're literally just spinning up a framework, people will be able to come in, collaboratively develop something, and in terms of IT at least, if you took one IT person from every single federal agency, so there's 200 federal agencies roughly, and they all came in and they worked on something for one hour a week. In one week, you get 200 hours of IT development. And if you're here at GovHack and you could see what teams of three could achieve in 48 hours, the cost benefits to government in doing this sort of collaboration is just massive. And same with policy. You could have a master template that you download, um, tweak it, improve the policy, put it back. Lead agencies could easily crowdsource um, sort of policy ideas from other agencies and everyone can work on things together and get done, get more done with less. So um, yes, comments, I've got a notepad because we, um, we want comments, we want ideas, we want... No, not yet, not yet. It's making sure everyone else can hear you. What is there to actually do to make, what was it, GovForge, PolicyForge? Gov physically what isn't already done? Because if you put, um, if you okay. put policy into SourceForge now, where, you have where are you from? Want. I'm from Defence. You're from Defence? I'm from WA. So, Defence WA. Uh, do you use SharePoint? Oh, God no. God no, but Defence does use some SharePoint. The nasty ones do. Yeah. The nasty ones. Um, anyone who does use SharePoint, if you've ever rung up another agency and gone, hey, I love what you've done with that web part, can you give it to me? No, <laughs> go and get your own developers. Um, you know, we all do the same things all over government, and yet we all go off and buy our own stuff. You know, we all need to log into websites. So why isn't there a standard government login? that just talks to Vanguard, for instance. Um, from the defence point of view, a number of us use Linux. We know that defence use Linux. Why isn't there a common defence image for a Linux box? Of what? It, government distribution. You have distros. Um, how many of us have a social media policy? How many have shared their social media policy with someone else? And how many can guarantee that their social media policy is exactly the same as everyone else's because we all engage with the public in the same way? If we all just had a social media policy, a basis that we could just add specific BAU bits to, it would make sense. I'm going to play the devil's advocate there though, Chris. <laughs> Each agency, particularly just taking a social media policy mm. example, does a different thing in that context. So. Oops, sorry, closer. Is that close enough? 
Thank you. <laughs> um, so each government agency does a different thing. So we at the archives, for example, one of our main purposes when communicating with the public is, is purely about pushing information out to people to help them understand about the types of information that we hold for them and then engage with them perhaps through crowdsourcing to collect information back from them. Whereas I can look at somebody like Centrelink who really does need to engage. They need to be actively involved in a discussion with them two different social media policies are kind of needed for each of those agencies, in my mind, which provide very specific information and very specific instruction for them. Do they need to keep records? Yes. There's a common element. Sure. Do they need to um, have standardised loggings? Do they yes. need to have workflow processes? Yes. <laughs> Also, because um, we actually went through the process, I, I just stole it from you, sorry, went through the process a few years ago and I was um, very much outside the government pushing in, I guess right now I still am, um, but yeah, um, I'm waiting for security clearance. Anyway, um, uh, pushing in and looking at um, all of the development that happens in government that is um, that they want to open source. And uh, of course the problem is risk mitigation. The moment you put something online, you're bound by the Trade Practices Act, which basically says, you know, anything you put online, you are giving an implicit warranty to. So the idea of an open source clearing house was sort of raised at the time and was thought about quite a lot. I actually think the GovForge is gonna fill this role because it mitigates the risk of agencies in putting software up that they wanna share, not just with other agencies, but possibly even publicly as well, so that they can get um, so they can work with people to create better and versions, um, but um, but it just makes it easier to share with each other because at the moment that's very very hard to do. So uh, it also is something that you could put it on SourceForge, but SourceForge is a US hosted project. I'm assuming this is hosted in Australia by Australian company. By government. Yep, by government. There you go. Uh, so it's not subject to the Patriot Act, which is of course a big issue with cloud. So um, there's a couple of little ideas. For and you. actually, it's interesting you say cloud there because. <laughs> There is no cloud in this sense. The way that SourceForge works, um, and even if it was policy development or anything else, is you download a copy yourself into your own organisation, you work on it. If you're happy with what you've done, you release it back into the thing. You don't even need to be connected to the master except to do that download or commit. So most agencies already have something like this in place internally for their developers. And there's certainly no reason you couldn't use it for everything you do. And how many of you have wikis? Are you using it for policy development? One person. Um, <laughs> and version control, systems that do version control, it's not the same thing because you don't get to have a discussion about the changes that you're making as you're making them with the other people. Three of you can't check out the same thing at once and then all get together and go, well, hey, let's work on some stuff. You need your microphone, so that uh, people are listening. Yeah, I, um, I work at DIAC, and I don't work. Mm. I work in a policy role, not an IT role. Uh, DIAC, uh, since the Cornelia Rao stuff in 2005, uh, I think the latest total is something like 900 million dollars spent on systems uh, over a seven or eight year period, uh, and there's been some epic, epic failures in there. Um, we have, I think, 700 people working in our business services area. Uh, and this is stuff like, I don't think it's very widely known, like how big of a you know, stuff up this has been. Um, but hearing you talk about these things, like, to me it sounds fantastic. Um, but I suppose in a policy area in DIAC, it just doesn't seem like there's any chance of any of this sort of stuff happening, even in the long term, to, to me, just as, a, as an insi insider at DIAC. And I wonder if there are sort of steps along the way which can help facilitate this, you know, you talk about Linux, I talk about Windows IE 6 or whatever, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's those type of conversations that are... Well, actually, I'll, the uh, peer on her list had, because uh, I was down for number three as well, and I had three and a half networking for the win. So part of this is, okay, if you've got a platform in, 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 the, in the IT sense, um, Groups can be making a Linux version of that. Groups can be making a SharePoint version of that, an IE version, a Drupal version, a you know whatever version, and you can roll them out as long as they're using the same frameworks, connectors, APIs, that type of thing. But in government, in terms of getting this idea up, and a lot of people have said, oh yeah, we've talked about this, and, and, and now it's happening, how have you done it? That is your biggest weapon in making innovation happen. 
I ring people up. I go to the gold directory, I'll ring up someone at the SES level and I'll go, hi, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, can you connect me to someone in your area? I need to talk. And if you are in an area in DIAC where you know, you've got a policy that could be informed by someone else, ring them. Say, hi, this is who I am. You're not allowed to use the telephone in DIAC. No, no, no. What if, for example, that at your level, I'm not, I'm not saying this is an explicit policy because it's not, uh, and I wouldn't want to sort of defame the organisation I work for, but uh, I think it would be frowned upon if I were to ring up uh, an SES BAM 1 out of the blue and to talk... Not, uh, just, not just SES, no, but no, some I at your level even. Yeah, yeah but I mean, but I, mean I, I think Gold's a fantastic service mm. and stuff, but obviously it only goes down to a certain level. It, it's, uh, it's, I find it very, very difficult to even to be able to talk to to other people in other departments at certain stages around new ideas, uh, and I agree that it should be encouraged and fostered and stuff. But uh, so having an online environment where you could remain relatively anonymous in that you're just an email, or even having an online environment where you're actually allowed to talk to mm. other people to your yeah, and this is the interest group around developing a customer service policy or a social media policy, then it's all government, it's all locked down. You can go in and you can say, this is the problem we're having. Who's been doing similar things? Who's come across this similar problem? And you'll be surprised how many people just go, here, here's something we did earlier. Um, Chris, I think this bit of a we ask what we can do type uh, uh, discussion and uh, in terms of that, I wholeheartedly endorse um, the concept of GovForge, but I think it's also important to realise that, you know, even as vendors, that we're contributing a, a lot to uh, all sorts of different government organisations. Just recently in the US, we announced one, which is government, and to have it and share it there, and it's, these are no-cost applications. So, you know, just don't think internally in terms of, of uh, GovForge that there are certainly um, um, similar sorts of things that have been set up by commercial organisations to help with that and you know I take a look at that and say look there's a whole lot of applications that are going into that which could you know then go out run on say uh, uh, an Amazon type uh, uh, infrastructure or something like that Heroku and things like that which give you the ability to innovate quickly and then decide whether it's something that you want to go forward with but at least you've been able to prove it up quickly and use some stuff that's been developed by your peers in other government agencies. Um, I do see that as something that will happen over time. Certainly in the open source space, um, wherever commercial vendors are doing it, they're sharing it back into the open source community, so we can always grab it. Um, but there are times where government shouldn't share. Security being a, a classic one. Um, Chris, this weekend was actually a really great example yeah. of sort of moving on from what you're talking about there, is that that's what GovHack was all about. Mm. It was about government going out and engaging with the community um, the whole of GovHack, everything was open source at the end of it. It was part of the rules about engaging, which meant the government could then leverage on the great ideas and the developments which took place and then be able to utilise their data for other sorts of purposes. Thank you. <laughs> um, so there, it's not as if this isn't already happening. It's mm. a bit of an inch-by-inch inch thing with government, though, and it can be just a matter of sort of having the next generation come through who understands what the benefits are of achieving these and how to manage the risks associated with them as well as understanding what the technology is able to achieve. Absolutely. We've, we've worked through this slowly and um, it's little steps. First is government to government. Um, then we'll need the, the cross-jurisdictional talking to the states, talking to local governments, um, even about basic policy is, is um, something we're yet to do really well. Connecting with academia, connecting with NGOs, um, is probably the next step and eventually you will get um, sort of far more commercial buy-in um, as well. I'm going to throw a quick comment in as well on my way to taking it to you, which isn't very far, so it's a quick question. Well, it's actually a comment. Um, I, uh, one of the things I've noticed in the States is, um, and you know, we don't, I, don't, I don't subscribe to the model that everything they do overseas is so much grander. I actually think we have a lot of great stuff happening here in Australia and I just want to give a huge kudos out for that. But, um, but one thing that I do like is that uh, I'm told that there is the web standards group in the States, which is made up of just a whole bunch of techie people, largely from the federal, uh, largely from the public service over there, and they actually are a inform information um, source to the office of the president. So you're actually getting that bottom-up advice to sort of 
not to counter necessarily, but to, to balance and to provide an alternate view to possibly the corporate perspectives and, and pure industry and pure academic perspectives that are coming through. I think that that engaging with the general community is really important, engaging with industry, academia, um, what was the other one I said? Industry, N academia, NGOs. and gov. Yep, NGOs definitely. Um, but also engaging with your own people, going out and getting a you know, big, you know, well-known name brand um, consultancy company to come in and tell you what to do is one thing, but your own people have the expertise. So tapping into those and empowering them to be awesome is, is a really great way to, I think, find innovation and empower people to rock who know the space. Sorry, taking your time. Um, hi, I'm Emma. I'm a community sector worker and we're looking to collaborate with government and academics all the time on um, public policy issues. Um, and it, I guess I just wanted to make the point that if you think it's hard getting one government department to collaborate with another government department, it's even harder when you're on the outside and you're not in any government department. Um, so I guess if you're, if you're in a government department and you're looking at um, implementing a new policy, um, I'd just like to throw out there that collaborating with the community sector who are big users of the kind of quantitative data that a lot of departments are holding or um, that, that sort of thing, that, that we can contribute back um, some really valuable information about why people sometimes make the choices that they do or why they might, you know, what the user end user experience might be of the, the policy or the system that you're trying to build. Um, so that collaboration could really add a lot of value, I think. All right, we're going to have to wrap this session up, um, is that, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and I think that that also talks to the open data agenda as well and the importance of getting access, not just to data, but to ways to interface with data and to tools to use the data. So we'll jump on, actually, Phil, just for two minutes. One minute. I just got to get the next session. That's me. <laughs> next session. Next session. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'll just quickly tell you what the next session is for your, so you can have a, can make an informed choice. The session happening in this room is um, maps.gov.au. Something networking for the win. Is that you? Yeah, that was right, that was you. Yeah, sorry, you've been there, done that. The other room is ideas is easy, avoiding the pitfalls of innovation. So um, feel free to switch between. Uh, you've got about a minute, and then Chris will get started again in here. Thank you. So I guess going straight on from that, the proof of concept deliverable that we're actually uh, you know, proving how GovForge works is setting up maps.gov.au. Now, I work on, um, up until Friday, because I've now moved into a bigger, more encompassing role, worked on myregion.gov.au. That uses an open source, um, open geospatial, internationally standards compliant mapping technology stack to deliver maps to government, or to d deliver maps on our site. Now, this came with a couple of issues. One, we're probably the first federal agency um, to display data to the public spatially where that data comes from everyone. So health has maps, and that's great. They use Medicare locals, and you can see the hospitals. Uh, education has maps, and that's great. They use, um, or employment, they use employment areas and small area labour markets, and they'll show you where the schools are and, and that type of thing. When you try to get those two data sets onto the one map, and they're not in the same standards, you have headaches. The other problem we had was that initially we said that, okay, we're going to let this mapping stack be used by anyone. If you want to stick a map on your web page and you're from government, you don't need to use Google anymore, you can use this map if you want to, it's there. Um, and SUPAC, quite, um, and probably quite wisely, sat there and said, well, we want to make our own map. And I said, well, you can use ours. And they said, well, no, because um, that's your territory and we want to have our own. And I said, no, 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 you don't get it. You can have our code. You can have the entire thing on a disk, stick it on your own server and run it. And then the next question raised was, how do we get it? Which led to GovForge, funnily enough. How do we get the code to people? We've taken this a step further in working with OSP to come up with this idea of maps.gov.au. It will be a whole of government mapping service where you can come and simply grab a common set of tiles, fancy that every single government department, state or local, having the same map. So if you go and look at two different maps, they've got the same tiles. 
the same roads, the same towns, rather than someone using Google, someone else using Bing, someone else using Esri in-house, someone else using OpenStreetMaps. Um, and then we can plug in things like the Gazetteer, which is the place names of Australia. So again, you're not relying on Google to tell you where the new development is or you know, where did that suburb go, which is problems that we have. We have a common government service that everyone can connect to and um, look up place names. By putting it in GovForge, we can deliver it. But um, yeah, I guess the other thing is that um, we're just telling you that, yes, this service is going to be here. Now, in doing the maps.gov.au and GovForge, that also means we need to develop policies around how people connect to it, how people use it, um, even coming up with basic things like everyone agreeing on a common set of icons because a H on the map for health is a hospital, a H on the map for the Air Transport Safety Bureau is a helipad. God help you if you get sick and you try to go to an airport or you try to land at a hospital. And just those little things, letting us all have a place to agree on policy, on how we're doing things. Um, but yes, thoughts about um, a mapping service for everyone. Sorry, I'm sure there's other people who have contributed to this as well too, but certainly have been working with uh, data.gov data sets for a period of time now with a, an application that we've built uh, for community. And I guess a couple of things I'd uh, ask. You know, given that there's uh, such a high usage of uh, tablets and, and mobile uh, phones these days, um, just whether this uh, mapping is going to work with those or whether you're better to just run with uh, the generic mapping which comes with, uh, with those particular products? Yes, it will work with tablets. Okay, good. Um, We're still working through a couple of minor bugs because they've only uh, been released about two weeks ago. Yeah. But yes, it's fully tablet friendly. Yeah. Well, I, I guess in terms of you know, what are people familiar with and if there's already mapping capability uh, or mapping products on those uh, particular platforms, uh, why, not, uh, why not use them rather than building yet another system? One, just because people are familiar with it doesn't mean it's a good thing. Um, in 2001, I think it was, Helen? Maybe you know? Google stopped using PSMA map tiles mm -hmm. and they went to crowdsource map tiles. Instantly, overnight, entire suburbs disappeared off the map. The other thing from our point of view, and we are regional Australia, and most departments and even local governments um, do things on a regional sense, Google's coverage out in the country is not that good. But we have the data. We just need to put it on a map. And that can be authoritative. And our maps can look very pretty. They can look as good as Google's. So it's about people giving people that experience they're used to, but we have fi uh, an authoritative um, data set that works. Uh, I guess the other point is, um, ties back to spatial and also to in terms of standards for uh, data. Uh, take you know, data.gov right now, and there's um, toilet map, and uh, I think it's uh, Centrelink are the only two that have actually got... Uh, I don't think that Centrelink might have the, a geocoded Latin long on it. But that sort of information, having a service there that as data goes across into there, if you want to you know, overlay that on top of these maps to at least make sure the data that's going through uh, to data.gov, irrespective of what your agency is, has got Latin long on it so that mm. you can start to incorporate it into these uh, multi-layers maps. And that's, I guess, an important part of it in that the the map stack, what we'll call maps.gov, while you can connect to it automatically, the other thing is it is open source and the policies will also be open source, so the policies will be open for reuse um, and the APIs and everything else. So if you're a local government sitting in Western Australia, you can spin up your own. If you're a state agency, you can spin up your own. And the idea will be, and that's probably the, the proper part of the service, is it will be a distributed network. And as each, every node comes online, a browser will, a user will come to it, and if they're in Western Australia and they're looking at our map and our site, they will connect automatically to the nearest, by GOIP, instance of the maps and get fast maps and fast data. If they're also using it in-house, these, these agencies or local government, they can put their own data in it as well, which they don't need to share for whatever reason. Um, or we can go back to a common pool of data on data.gov.au or through web services or... Or, or whatever. So, yeah, we obviously data quality is always going to be um, very, very important in data management. 
Chris, um, I'd like to just reiterate the, uh, the issue about Google. Um, and uh, what you have to keep in mind is fit for purpose when it comes to spatial. So Google's fine if you want to just uh, find your way to a restaurant or something. Um, but if you want to do anything with any great fidelity, the data is not uh, authoritative. Um, and the second point I'd like to make about data.gov.au, um, there has been um, some discussions between the Office of Spatial Policy and uh, uh, AGIMO um, and the Office of the Information Commissioner who was here this morning. Um, and we've come up with an arrangement where OSP will become the business owner of data.gov.au um, and uh, the Office of the Information Commissioner will be the policy lead um, and uh, Ajimo will be the technical lead. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is work with the uh, Bureau of Meteorology on the National Environmental Information Infrastructure and we're going to test case how we can build data.gov to actually deliver something that is going to be worthwhile. Hi Helen. Um, just to sort of, I'm just trying to get clear in my head, the National Archives, one of the biggest things which we've got to deal with at the moment is setting standards for, sorry, setting standards for digital information and how we're going to store and transmit and, and make government data more accessible and considering the wealth of information which we've got, it's one of the biggest challenges that we're going to face is what are the standards that we need to stick to. In this little triangle of government agencies which are going to be looking at managing data.gov.au, are they going to look at setting formats or working alongside other agencies who have got immense amounts of data to help them work out how, what is the best format to make that information accessible into the future and ensure that it's in a format that's flexible enough to match technology as it evolves? You know, I think the answer to that is um, you would be a custodian and it would be your responsibility to set your standards around your data. But you would need to do that with uh, the technology in mind and um, it would be for you to um, publish, I guess, um, your data in the right format. Actually, can I jump in there as well? Just let me jump into this one just quickly. Um, one of the, I suppose, one of the biggest downfalls or critics of um, uh, data.gov.au has been the inconsistency which makes it almost impossible for people to do proper analysis across all of government issues. Um, surely there's a role for these government agencies to be taking the lead to ensure that there is consistency so that to use John Sheridan's analogy that the wealth of the, 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 the knowledge within government can be mined by commercial companies so that they can do something valuable with it because quite frankly we just don't have the resources to do everything that we should do. Um, is there a response to that, that there's surely a leading role here? Well, that sort of ties into, I guess, what I was going to say. One of the things we do with um, Office of Spatial Policy is we're tasked with coming up with the Government Information Location Framework. And we've been talking about what that means. Now, between us and OSP, we might come up with the Government Location Framework, but we also talk to ABS about, say, a Government Statistical Framework. And we're slowly forming this, this idea of... Um, to actually come up with a whole of government framework, you need to have your lead agencies. This is no different. In data.gov.au land, um, you won't set the standards for publishing, you won't set the standards for spatial, but you will be the lead agency on records management standards and probably metadata. So everyone will look to you as the lead agency, but when it comes to, say, um, spatial, you'll look to OSP. When it comes to style and, and web display, it would be a GMO. Because, um, yes, everyone does have a part to play. People do have to step up and go, yes, we're the lead agency on this. So the project that I talked about in BOM, um, the National uh, Environmental Information Infrastructure, um, it's a fairly small project with a, with a pretty tight turnaround. It's about 18 million, I think. Um, and we're going to do some work with uh, Sharon um, 
I uh, can't remember her last name, from Ajimo, who looks after data.gov.au. Um, and OSP's role is to set the business rules around how data.gov.au works. And we've got a bit of a vision about connecting um, in a linked fashion um, using cloud to various jurisdictional data, data New South Wales, data Northern Territory, and you know, slowly build up this kind of ability to link all of this information. I think part of that too, actually, we've also got the data dot, yeah, like you said, which is more of a distributed network, but um, certainly for you, Jeff, there's going to be a need, certainly, at the, at the, well, there's going to be a need, and it, it applies to everyone, in that you're going to have to connect with all of the archives around the country and all agree on your standards that they, then you tell us. I was just using the archives as an example. Um, it said this is a government and a, a nationwide issue that needs to be resolved. Mm. That's all. Yeah, I, I suppose just from like the maps perspective and from the data perspective as well, uh, at immigration we have lots and lots and lots of data. Uh, I can imagine that we would use the mapping, even in our little area, we could definitely use this mapping stuff. We don't use the... I don't think there's any immigration data on data.gov.au at the moment. It's been around for a long time. Uh, with this triangle, I suppose, is there going to be ways to engage these sort of big service delivery agencies like Faxia and, and Health and Immigration and, and these type of places where you just have so much? Uh, and the same with the maps. Like, how do you guys work with people who have absolutely no idea about this stuff to get the service to the standard it should be and to to make it useful, um, because I've tried to use data.gov.au before and I haven't found anything useful there. We come to things like this and tell you about them and oh, get no, ideas. No, no, no. I, I, I think that's a positive first step, but I mean, you don't need to convince me. Mm. I'm, I'm convinced. I've been convinced. Uh, you need to convince a lot of people at the top. Uh, and I'm sure that there are ways that are being planned, um, but data.gov.au has been around for a long time and it hasn't sunk in yet, so maybe there's something different we need to do. Three minutes left. Surely somebody's got a question about data in government. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, I just wanted to um, sort of give you a bit of kudos and support for the for all the ideas that you're coming up with and for the idea of a mapping, um, um, I suppose, a underlying mapping service for for the public sector. Just playing devil's and, advocate, I guess. Academia. Uh, just playing devil's advocate, I guess, um, one thing you could do, of course, is leverage the private sector's infrastructure and publish the data in such a way that it could be used. Uh, it could be viewable through Google and, uh, and, um, and other technologies. And I would encourage you to, to do that in addition to putting your own infrastructure in place. It seems to me that fairly fundamental that countries, as jurisdictions, would want to have their own mapping infrastructure. I think it's, it's a sort of almost an in-principle thing. But at the same time, those mechanisms that are out there on the web are used by the public to a huge extent. And if we could take out perhaps our better data and publish it uh, through those mechanisms as well as our internal infrastructure, I think we'll be doing everybody a, um, a great service. Well, we do. We are, actually. Um, and that comes back to the standards. Because this is um, both W3C and, and Open Geospatial Consortium standards based, uh, Google, um, Esri, a lot of the big name players in the mapping space, for instance, um, are a part of that consortium. We use the consortium standards. We publish web feeds, uh, so web services, um, to allow people to connect to the data. Um, and the data that goes into it, say on data.gov, they will need to be ready to be dropped into that format. So yes, yeah, standards informs everything, and that currently is probably the best connection between uh, the commercial world and government is in these standards organisations. Um, so we, we can't just go off and do our own thing, um, and nor can Google. We all follow standards, which means Google can come and grab our data and put it on their own service, and we can grab the Google data and put it on our service. 
um, just as easily. Because Google Fusion tables, some of them on data like other, you do Google Fusion tables, and those things are awesome. It's like, you know, we can't do that yet. And why wouldn't you put it out like that? Because it lets the public play with it. Um, I guess the final point I'd make is there's a lot of work going on in this space um, since I started four months ago. Um, and uh, we'll try and keep people informed, but a um, bit of a plug for uh, our conference, Spatial at Gov. Um, we'd like to see more people who are non-spatial coming along to Spatial at Gov to learn about uh, what we're doing uh, with location information and how policy, uh, decision making, service delivery um, and a whole range of government uh, business processes can be supported by spatial information. So please come along. And I guess it's it, actually on that, it's more than just um, please come along, it's come along. We need you there. And it's not just for spatial either. It's uh, GovHack was a great example. We had awesome, awesome programmers in the room. But what we didn't have was policy people coming along and going, this is the problem I've got. I need to report on this, or I'd like to know how to do this, and giving those programmers something to latch onto to come up with a solution. Um, and probably the same can be said for any of the policy conferences where you need an IT person or a data person coming along and going, um, I've got this thing, is there a policy for this? Or how would I write this policy? We need to jump out of our, our comfort zones. We're going to call up there, Chris. Um, cool. Let's kick off the next session, which is? So that was the first three sessions. Uh, that's one hour. Uh, we're now almost back on time. Uh, we've actually run reasonably well to time today, but not quite. Um, so you have now two options. You could, uh, sorry, three options. You could either go into the other bar camp room, which is going to be running in 2015, what should our communications look like? Uh, you can go into studio room one, which is at this end, which will be a um, workshop on public engagement with um, Bang the Table. You can go in workshop number two, uh, which is in studio two, conveniently, which is the academic forum, which is bringing academia and high, um, senior public service together to talk about innovation. Or you could stay in here for... Dun, 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 dun. The power of network and communications in f fostering public sector innovation and transformation.